to join one. And if you don't know how, you can comment in the comment section below. I want to join a life group, and somebody will be there to help you out. Um, and you know, this Christmas season, if you are feeling alone or, you know, just full of anxiety, family is always a good way to help relieve that. Hello to everybody else joining us now. Welcome to our English service. If you're just joining us now, I was just encouraging our um, brothers and sisters to reconnect with their life groups as people are uh, joining us this morning. You know, if you haven't reconnected with them because of the pandemic, you know, we encourage you to reach out to your leaders, um, to your small group leaders, to your network leaders. And if you don't know um, who to reach out to or if you would like to find a different group or if, you know, things aren't working out, you know, it's, that's fine. Um, but we just want to encourage you to join a life group. And if you haven't had one yet, um, comment down below, I want to join a life group. And so, yeah, this is our Christmas uh, season. Um, and, you know, we invite you to our Christmas service, uh, December 24th. There is no service on Christmas Day, um, just on Christmas Eve. And, yeah, um, praise and worship will start very soon. worship our God this morning. Come on, let's clap our hands. Whose birthday angels 
your name, O oh Jesus. We praise your name. And you are worthy to be praised, O oh God. Worthy of all our worship.
actually flees, oh God. Light comes in, oh Lord. And this morning, oh God, we are just grateful. We are just so grateful, oh God, of what you did in the cross 2,000 years ago, oh God. For dying in behalf of us, oh Lord. We the sinners, Lord. For truly that, Father, you are so good that you gave your only begotten Son to die on the cross in the place of us sinners. This morning, Lord, we just wanted to sing how grateful we are and thankful we are for the cross.
for your goodness and your kindness God Jesus that you never leave us the same God that you come and you transform us Jesus and father we ask today that you would help us remember the goodness that you've given us God Jesus that you've transformed our lives and you know if we're still waiting for that miracle that breakthrough God that we're not sitting still God but we're praising you anyways God despite our circumstances despite what we see in the flesh God we know that you are working in the background Jesus and so we thank you God we thank you Jesus so church come on why don't you keep worshiping God today hallelujah Jesus you are worthy of our praise hallelujah God there's nobody like you there's nobody like you Jesus why don't we sing this again with all our hearts season of Christmas God that we're reminded that you came when you didn't have to God that you came as a child you humbled yourself God you took on earthly flesh and earth earthly mess God but rather than coming to rule you came to serve 
And Jesus, you didn't just come, you finished the work on the cross. And so Jesus, I pray that we would remember, God, that you didn't just come to give us hope, but you fulfilled it, God, through your death and resurrection. And so Jesus, this morning, would you fill us with hope this season? Would you remind us of what Christmas is all about? And not just the cliches, God. You know, not just the cliches, the Hallmark movies, but Jesus, true gratitude for what you've done. God, fill us with hope and joy and peace, God. God, that you bring good news of great joy, that we may spread it to the world. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You may take a seat. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Doing well? <laughs> um, you know, we've, uh, uh, as a church, we just want to remind you that we still do life groups. I know a lot of life groups haven't uh, uh, met in a while, uh, but you know, if you haven't connected with yours, connect. This is the season to connect and to be with family and to celebrate God's goodness before the new year. Um, if you don't have a life group, um, check out our info center, talk to one of our pastors, find somebody who you think is a leader, and they will point you in the right direction, all right? Yeah? Yeah? All right. Um, we just want to remind you that every Sunday morning, um, we have a prayer meeting at 7.30 a.m. via Zoom. Um, it's early, but God is good. He's worthy of our praise. And, you know, we don't pray just for a good service here, but we pray that God would move in people's lives here and all over the world. Um, so we invite you to that. Uh, we also want to encourage you to invite your friends and family to our Christmas Eve service. Um, it's called A Thrill of Hope, um, you know, because this past couple Christmases have been pretty tough uh, for a lot of people. But, you know, Christ still gives hope. Christmas is still about hope. Um, and so why don't you invite them? And we invite you as well, of course, um, to that. And so I am the youth director of Uprising. That is our youth from grades uh, 7 to 12. And if you know anybody, we're having a Christmas party this Friday at 7 p.m. And uh, tell them to wear pajamas. Um, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some karaoke. Um, and, of course, we're going to fellowship in God's love. Uh, so you're invited to that. And also, uh, we as a church... Uh, support Philippine Frontline Mission, which is a, a missions in uh, the Philippines. And so if you are already a partner, thank you for giving. Um, but if you are not, we encourage you, you know, pray about it and ask the Lord um, if this is something that you, you should be partnering with him um, and do as the Spirit leads. Amen. And so, yeah, we just want to continue to thank you for your donations and your tithes and offerings and your faithful giving. Um, you know, we have the debit machine um, over there um, at the end of the service, but also just uh, ways of giving online. Um, and so why don't we pray for that um, before we uh, head to the message. So, Father God, we thank you uh, for your provision, God, that never fails. Uh, Jesus, that through um, the tumultuous, you know, events in our lives that you are constant and you are faithful. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us a cheerful heart to give, not because we're forced to or because we're mandated to, um, but because, God, you deserve our first fruits. Um, and we want to lay it back to you, all the blessings that you've given us. And so we love you and we obey this commandment of tithing. Um, we give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today here at uh, 1077. And to those who are watching online, wherever you may be, uh, if you're on the other side of the globe, good evening. Thank you for joining with us. Let me start by just being thankful to those who have actually helped decorate the church for Christmas. I know you guys are busy. You know who you are. But thank you very much for making our church building have the Christmas feel. So God bless you. Really appreciate that. <laughs> well, Christmas is just around the corner, and I hope that you guys are not stressed. It's not a season of stress, but a season of joy and hope and peace and love. And so let's focus on the real meaning and purpose of Christmas. You know, I, I, I read a story concerning Peter Haas, the lead pastor of Substance Church, Substance Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He shared a very sobering yet funny story of his attitude while driving on the freeway of Minneapolis. I don't know if you have driven in the, the highways of Minneapolis, the freeways. I remember the first time I drove there in 2000. I think that was 2000 when we drove together with my family. And so it was my first time to drive the freeway of Minneapolis. And then eventually we went to Chicago, and it was actually far worse than Minneapolis. <laughs> and then, of course, we visited my folks in New Jersey and New York. That's definitely 20 lanes in the New Jersey Turnpike. That's definitely worse than worse. And so he was sharing a story of you know, how it was stressful driving the freeway freeways of Minneapolis, and, and uh, he was annoyed by many drivers. So when you drive the freeways, those freeways in major cities, you cannot help it but annoyed by the driving of a lot of people. And so he was already a, a resident of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and yet he was annoyed by the many drivers in front of him who were clueless to the blinkers of their cars left on. Have you seen somebody driving with their blinkers like, flashing to the right, you know, flashing to the left, and, and they had no idea that the blinkers were on. And you were annoyed? Were you annoyed by that? Because you don't know if they're going to turn right or stay in the lane. And so Peter has a pastor, was so annoyed by those people. And so he started uh, uh, getting annoyed and gestured angrily at one of the drivers, and a rat suddenly leaped out of his mouth, like a roaring tiger. I don't know if you probably said it yourselves. And he said, can you believe all these stupid drivers? What is wrong with everybody? And, the, and right before he finished, he looked down at his dashboard and saw a horrifying revelation. Yeah, <laughs> he was the one who had his blinker on. In fact, the other drivers were signaling to him. <laughs> and so I don't know if that happened to you. You were angry at the other drivers, but your blinkers were also on <laughs> without you knowing it. So the title of my message this morning is Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, the objective of this message is to distinguish Christ from the religious leaders of his time for the simple reason so that we can emulate Christ instead of the religious leaders of his time. And also so that we can identify the Pharisee in us or the religious leaders' attitude and mentality that those religious leaders during Jesus' time. And we repent of those things and surrender it to the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem with Christianity or any religion for that matter, if we grow in head knowledge, there's also a possibility of becoming prideful. And this pride leads to a condescending attitude of thinking we are holier than other people. When we make comparisons with our piety, you know, in comparison to other people. And last but not the least, also to give us tools to know who is behaving and speaking like a Pharisee or those who are behaving and speaking like Jesus, especially online. You know what happened during this pandemic is that we spend our time mostly on the computer, on the internet, and looking at YouTube 
And we don't just watch um, secular shows, we also watch religious shows. And so therefore, we can actually distinguish. You know, sometimes we cannot distinguish on the words and the teachings and the theology, but more so on the attitude of the one speaking. Is that a Jesus attitude that he is demonstrating or displaying, or is that the attitude of a Pharisee? Now, I'll explain to you what a Pharisee is. It is, if you have not read the Bible, you know, this is actually the Pharisees are one of the major four sects or denominations or religious groups during the time of Jesus. And the Pharisees, they were at the top of the pecking order. Okay? They were considered to be the top dog of all of the denominations or religious groups. And so when Jesus came into the picture as a preacher in the nation of Israel, a religious society, meaning it was run, the culture is, is based on the religion of the Jews, and of course, uh, it was the only nation as a whole who worshipped the living God. And most of the nations, like the Greeks and the Romans, they worship false gods. Not the Israelites. The Israelites were God's chosen people, God's chosen nation. And so when Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the whole world from sin and its condemnation, came to the picture as a preacher, there were established religious groups in the Jewish religious society. And the Pharisees were at the top of the food chain. They were the highly respected, highly feared group of religious people and religious leaders for that matter. Now, the Pharisees were also, for the most part, in collaboration with the scribes or lawyers or the teachers of the law. Now, the scribes or the lawyers or the teachers of the law, they're the ones who are expert in the interpretation of the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, and of course, the prophets, like the book of Isaiah, and the main minor prophets, like Malachi. And so, they were mostly in collaboration with the scribes or the teachers of the law so that the interpretation is accurate, and so therefore they may be able to apply it in, a, in an accurate way. Of, of course, in confrontations and debates, that they have the backing of those who are experts of the law. Okay? And so they run the show and determine by their interpretation of the law which practices are acceptable and unacceptable. And so the Pharisees were entrenched when Jesus came. And so when Jesus came into the picture, Jesus did not join any of the groups. And, and that was considered to be a, a, a wrong decision, a big mistake. Because now they have, they're not part of the Sadducees or the SNNs or the Zealots. In fact, one of the disciples of Jesus called Simon the Zealot was formerly part of that group. So now he became a target. He became a target because the other groups were threatened by this new rabbi or this new teacher. But let me, let me start by defining who is a Pharisee during Jesus' time. From Larry Osborne, a pastor and author, he said, in Jesus' day, being called a Pharisee was a badge of honor. It was a compliment, not a slam. That's because first century Pharisees excelled in everything we admire spiritually, especially being ceremoniously pure. There were so many purification requirements for a believer, a worshiper of God during the time of the Old Covenant. You're not even allowed to eat pork or pig because that's considered an unclean animal. That, that is not supposed to be eaten, not just because of health reasons, but also it makes you you know, uh, unacceptable to God, especially when you go into the temple to worship God. That's a sin to eat pork in the Old Testament. Of course, now it's no longer uh, true because Paul said it's not what we eat that makes us holy, makes us righteous. And even Jesus stated that it's not what comes out, comes in, of our, in through our mouth, but what comes out of our hearts. That is what makes us impure. Okay? And so they were very, very, uh, to the letter, to the dot of the law. And they were zealous for God and completely committed to their faith. And they were masters, theologically astute masters of the biblical text. Meaning, they were not, they were not just mentioning certain scriptures or text or verse without 
researching and studying it thoroughly. You know, just recently we, we, were, we were done with our Apollos project. It's the study on hermeneutics and exegesis, meaning the tools needed to interpret the Bible, and then exegesis meaning to bring out the meaning of the text, and then homiletics to, to, to preach it properly or to teach it properly. And so they were like that. They were hermeneutically, exegetically devoted and, 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 and trying to be as perfect as possible. And they don't want to miss anything, even the most obscure commands. Every detail, very particular. Okay, even with the, the ceremonial you know, stuff that, that probably is, you know, very a tiny part or small part of the whole process, they would like to know that clearly. And even add to it just so that they will not be missing anything. Their embrace of spiritual disciplines was second to none, meaning they were highly respected, they were very devoted, and everybody knows it. And given a choice, everybody wants to be a Pharisee. But the requirements is actually really not, 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 so, not, not, not easy. In fact, if you are uh, 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 somebody who wants to be part of the group, you have to go through all nine months to 12 months of purification. Meaning you would not, you know, fellowship with the Gentiles, non-Jews, or even sinners, you know, that are Jewish. You are to stay away from them, and you have to be careful who you touch, what you touch, where you go, for a year. So that you can be acceptable or accepted to the group. So in the first century, during the time of Jesus, you know, they, it, they don't have any negative connotation when it comes to being a Pharisee. They didn't have a negative um, or evil reputation. Nowadays, if I post or, 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 or I message somebody on Facebook or Instagram and said, hey, pastor so-and-so, I can see that you're a Pharisee. I don't think I'll get a, a thank you note or mo message back and say, thank you, Junie, for calling me a Pharisee. No, they will, they, will, they will defend themselves. They will fight back and say, you're the one who's a Pharisee. Because now in our time, it has a negative connotation. Especially when you are the student of the Bible, if you have read the scriptures, the New Testament, you have seen that the Pharisees were the enemies of Christ. They were threatened by him, and they want to expose him to be a fake or a false teacher and prophet. And so the purpose of our, 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 our message this morning is so that we can distinguish Christ from the religious spirit, the religious mentality that doesn't just, you know, exist during the time of Jesus, but actually exists even in our time. And could actually really be in some dark corners of our hearts. And also to give us the tools to be able to distinguish between those who teach and preach the Word of God with the attitude and the character of Christ compared to those who are like the religious people of Jesus' time, especially the Pharisees. And so let's see the difference between the two. Number one, Jesus brought God's righteousness while the Pharisees did on their own and promoted their self-righteousness. Okay? Now when you say God's righteousness, it means that God has mercy and grace to those who will admit their unrighteousness those who will repent of their wickedness, acknowledge their being sinners, and God extends forgiveness. God extends mercy and grace. The self-righteous are the ones who are actually doing the laws of God by self-effort, and if they have done so many things or they have done uh, most of it, or probably they have attended all of the religious events and activities and rituals, uh, then they become prideful and they become condescending of those who are not at par or in opposition or the opposite opinion of their beliefs. Self-righteousness is defined as the, or self-righteous person is defined as one who is confident in his or her own righteousness. That's why the term self-righteousness. I am righteous and I am better than others. And I am righteous before God because of what I have done. Now, God's righteousness is not because of what we have done. In fact, we are unrighteous because of what we have done. 
And therefore, we need God's righteousness by acknowledging our unrighteousness. And that's when God extends grace, unmerited favor. It's not something you can earn. But the Pharisees are steep in self-righteousness because they believe that they know the whole law of Moses, they know the Old Testament, the Scriptures, and they believe that they are living it and practicing it perfectly. And so therefore, it makes them superior, even, even before God. You know, they think themselves, you know what, without any fault. A self-righteous person also shows superiority above all others, especially if they have a different opinion than others. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law or the scribes, the lawyers, and the Pharisees. See the collaboration here? See the partnership here? You would see a lot of this, the, the, the teachers of the law, the scribes, and the lawyers, and the Pharisees. And you will never enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you read the scripture before this, or the verses before this verse, it speaks of those who consider themselves to be great because they teach the word. But Jesus said, if you teach the word and you don't apply it, you are the least in the kingdom. But if you teach the word or the will of God or the laws of God and apply it, then you become the great, you can become great in the kingdom of God. And so the, the righteousness of the Pharisees and the script, uh, the law, the teachers of the law are based on their self-effort, based on their performance, based on their own self-goodness. And the Bible said that kind of a righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. Filthy rags based on the time of Jesus or in the Old Testament. You know what? is you know, still similar to filthy rags during a time. It's filthy, it's dirty, it's stinky. So self-righteousness, self-effort, striving to please God on our own merit is like a filthy rag. It's dirty, it's stinky in the eyes of God. God's righteousness that Jesus brought is admit you're a sinner and then God will give you mercy and grace. Amen? See the opposite here? Polar opposite. I am good. I have done great things. I'm a good person. God, make me enter the kingdom of heaven. Make me go to heaven when I die. No, God's righteousness is this. I'm a sinner. I need help. I need forgiveness. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, help me to stop sinning. And Then you take on or receive God's righteousness, and you enter the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 14, Jesus told the story of the self-righteousness of the Pharisees and how Jesus rejects that. Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Again, self-righteousness means not just that you're righteous on your own, in your own sight, but you also condemn others. Okay? Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. Now, if you go to the book of Matthew the word Pharisee or Pharisees were mentioned at least 30 times, and it's mostly negative. In the book of Luke, it's around 26 to 27 times, and this is one of those. And the other was a despised tax collector. Now, a tax collector is somebody who collects taxes for Roman occupiers. These are Jewish men who collect for Rome okay, from their own people. So they were considered not just traitors, but sinners of the religious society. And on top of that, they were corrupted men. They corrupt the whole system and they collect more than what is expected. And so they, they, they add insult to injury. They don't just collect foreign or, or occupying tax. They also steal from their, their struggling brothers and sisters. And so they were despised by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the priests and the high priests and, and the entire religious society. So the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. See how he started. At least there's a thank you. But the thankfulness of this person is based on his self-righteousness, not in the righteousness of God. Okay? It's based on his behavior. It's based on his performance. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not, or thank you, God, that I'm not like other cheaters, sinners, like people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like the tax collector. So he saw the tax collector. Of course, they wear what tax collectors wear. 
Now, the religious people, they have their own attire to separate them from the crowd, to show to the others that you are dealing with a Pharisee. You're dealing with somebody who's devout and dedicated to the laws of Moses. Okay? And so they, he definitely, aside from probably knowing that person, but at the same time seeing it by his dress, by his attire. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Imagine fasting twice a week. And I give you a tenth of my income. In some translations, all my income. Every income. Because that's the proper tithing. Okay? Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all of your increase. Okay? My practice, our practice, is that when we receive gifts, we see, check the value of it and give a tithe. Or give a tithe out of it. Even adding the tax. And, and, and we're happy. We're not doing it as an obligation or something. We're just thankful that God has blessed us. Through many means and ways, even gifts. Are you with me? Okay? And I have seen the power of, of giving what belongs to the Lord. Because I have seen how God has blessed and prospered us in the process. And we're thankful. And so here, this guy was proud of the fact that he was doing it. Okay? Based on his ability to do it. Now, we cannot do this unless we have the grace of God. You know, in my case, I was never really generous. I only became generous or obedient to the will of God because of what He has done in my life. I have seen how He has changed me, transformed me from the inside out, and it's all by God's grace and mercy. If it wasn't for God's grace and mercy, I wouldn't be here. It's either I am dead, I am prison, or living a very miserable life, or making others miserable as well. But because of God's grace and mercy, He gave me the grace to become a child of God. He Gave me the born again experience called regeneration. And I'm here serving out of gratitude, not out of obligation. And so here was the guy who was proud of what he was doing according to the law of Moses. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. See, this is what God's righteousness. This is how God's righteousness is imputed on us. He admitted that he was a sinner. And so Jesus gave the commendation not to the Pharisee, but to the tax collector. I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified, forgiven, or made righteous, just. The unrighteous, ungodly tax collector became just by acknowledging he was a sinner and asking God for mercy but not the Pharisee who justified himself, who considered himself to be righteous. I hope you see the difference here. Amen? But Jesus said, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In fact, the new covenant runs in an agreement that we receive God's help, God's forgiveness, God's support, God's resources based on us admitting that we are sinners, we are weak, and we need help. That's how it works. That's the reason why, for the most part, we experience trials and troubles and hardships in life so that we can experience brokenness and, 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 and express our need for God. Because when we are strong, we are rich, we are powerful, we don't depend on God. Oh, we believe that, oh, I am rich because of my experience, because of my knowledge, because of my connections, because of all of these things. And you could be true to some extent because of, you know, human ability and connection are concerned. But you know what? You have to consider the fact that you're breathing because God is the one who's causing you to breathe. And the air we breathe belongs to God. And the talents you have and the way you were wired were all crafted and created wonderfully and carefully by God in your, in, when you are being formed in your mother's womb. And God would like to use all of your talents and gifts and all of the resources that he has given to you the right reason and for the right purposes. And you would see greater things than just doing it on your own. And so he allows us to go through trials. He allows us to go through sufferings so that when we are broken, he can make us whole in his image, in his likeness. He can reshape 
our inner being, and then He launches us to do great things for His glory, no longer for our own sake and glory, but for the glory of God and the benefit of others. And so here, Jesus said, to those who exalt themselves, they will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And we have seen the difference between God's righteousness and self-righteousness. Number two, Jesus preaches and teaches and demonstrates and, 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 and espouses clean hearts versus superficial holiness. Again, the, the Pharisees, they were focused on ceremonial purity to the letter, to the dot. But yet their hearts are not into what they're doing. They're just simply focused on what is on the surface, what is on the outside. And Jesus said, no, what matters in the eyes of God is the heart, a clean heart or a cleansed heart. In Luke chapter 11, verse 37 to 44, Jesus, after he was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him, for, um, invited him home for a meal. Now, Jesus went to any, any kind of person, any kind of groups or people, sinners, religious. He went because he came to seek and save the lost. He came to set the captives free. He came for whoever will call upon him for help who will open up their doors and their homes for him. And so Jesus, he came, and he ate the way he ate if he was eating with Peter, James, and John, and the other apostles, or anybody for that matter. And so while he was there, he went in and took his place at the table, and his host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by the Jewish custom. Now, this is more than just the washing of the hands because of covid Omicron, Delta, for physical health. This is for you to be holy when you're eating food. <laughs> for you to be pure in the eyes of God. So this is not just for the sake of hygiene. It's not just for the sake of, you know, getting rid of the germs. And so that when you eat, especially with your hands, you know, you don't acquire any sickness or virus or what, whatever. And so being around religious people, you have to, you're, you're, walking on, on, on like, you're like walking on broken glasses. You're always careful. But Jesus being a man of integrity, he did it in somebody, somebody else's house without even washing, by you know, try, going through the ceremonial washing. So he's going to do it with the Pharisee because he finds no reason to do it for the sake of being holy. But the Pharisees did that. Very important. Now, of course, you, you need to wash your hands if you need to, before you eat. We do that, but not because we want to be holy. And if we don't wash our hands, we're no longer holy. We're no longer pure or righteous in the eyes of God. We are now sinners. So that is not the case. But this was the case to the Pharisee. So then, then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and wickedness. Fools. <laughs> so this, why, this is the reason why they were threatened by Jesus. He was not just behaving differently. He didn't, he, it was not just because he didn't join any of the groups, but he was also exposing them. Okay? And I'll tell you the reason why you know, along the way. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside. Clean the inside. The evil, the, the, the greed, the selfishness there. Repent of it. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for change. Because you're showing piety and devotion to God, but for the most part, 99.9%, .9 all you care about is yourself. Because if you really are devoted to God, the Bible said the whole law and the prophets are summed up into two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if that is really your heart, then you know what happened? You have a clean heart. You are going to what? Giving gifts to the poor, and you will be clean all over. But it starts with cleaning your heart, acknowledging you're selfish, acknowledging you're, 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 you're greedy, acknowledging that your heart is evil, and ask God for help. And when that takes place, you will find yourself in the direction of being generous, compassionate, and giving. I'm just sharing to you my, my, my thought on Christmas. What if we stop having exchange gifts? And some of the people said, huh? I'm 
I'm expecting something from my mother. No, what if we, now we're blessed, we're rich, we're in a very affluent country called Canada, you don't feel the suffering of people in the third world country because we are, we are you know what, if your income, your family income is 40000 annually above, you are part of the top 3% rich people in the world. Just 40000 annually household income, you're already in the top 3% richest people in the world. So anybody here, are you part of the top three richest people in the world? Huh? Is your annual income together with your spouse and your son who goes who works at the McDonald's or Jollibee is 40,000 and up? Then my friends, you're rich compared to the 97% who are living in abject or below poverty level. <laughs> what if we stop exchange gift? What if? And then we as a family collect all of the amount of what was supposed to be given. Let's say, um, you know, your wife is buying you 50 bucks worth of whatever, or you are buying her uh, 500 bucks of uh, coach bag, or, you know, you're only worth 50 bucks, uh, but when you give to her, it should be 500 bucks, right? Or you will be boxed if you don't on Boxing Day. So what if, if and you're giving gifts to the kids and the kids are also are going to be walking to Dalarama after school buying mom something worth three fifty now, no longer just $1. And so you kind of gather all of that. Let's say you, you come up with a, a family of four or five, you come up with $650. What if we just go find somebody who's struggling right now in Winnipeg uh, because uh, they're not working or there's some uh, injury or sickness and... Okay. And then you buy them a, 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 a grocery gift card or a hamper. Or probably support somebody in the Philippines who's actually ministering to the poor, feeding the, the homeless people there. Find those kind of people who are doing good. And then instead of having exchange gifts, why don't we give it there? Imagine the impact of our generosity. Imagine the impact of focusing on others instead of ourselves. Are you with me? Because you and I will not die if we're not given a gift this Christmas. But there are people who could possibly starve to death if nobody would consider them and share them something to feed, give them basic necessities of life. Just a thought. Amen? And just a thought, if that would be the case, then I believe you have, a, you have the heart that God has already cleansed forgiven, and out of gratitude, you're doing this to the poor, the needy. Amen? Just a thought, okay? Number two, or number three, servanthood versus self-centeredness. We all know about this. I already talked about Jesus. He did not come to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Ransom, you owe something, and you were taken as a collateral, and Jesus came to pay for your for your loan or your mortgage or your debt so that he can redeem you. Imagine for a moment, if you went home and checked your bank, you don't have a mortgage anymore. Anybody here, you have a mortgage? Raise up your hand. I have a mortgage. I'm raising up my hand. So imagine you go there and check bmo.com, simply.com, rbc.com, and then you check your account. You don't have a mortgage anymore. You know why? Because your house has been repossessed. A sheriff was coming. No, no, just kidding. Or somebody paid your mortgage. Somebody pay, paid your car loan. What would you do? You would do a, a happy dance. <laughs> Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. He came to pay the ransom for you and me. We were sold to sin to Satan and hell. And then Jesus came, the Son of God, the Word of God became human, grew up to become a man, and eventually went to the cross to die for you and me. Isn't that amazing? The God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords did not come to be served, but to serve. The Pharisees were different. He said to them, what sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you love to sit in the seats of honor in the synagogues and receive respectful greetings as you walk 
in the marketplaces. They love importance, recognition, and being served. Jesus washed dirty, filthy disciples' feet. You know, in, in, in olden times, they don't have Adidas. They don't have Kobe. They don't have Jordan 207. I don't know anymore the numbers with Jordans. They don't have Nike. They don't have shoes. They had sandals. And th there were not much roads, although there was improvement to the road system because the Roman Empire, they were, they were the ones who brought the road, the road system. Okay? But still, it was dirty and filthy when you walk the streets or especially when you came from the countryside. And so when you go inside the house, they have slaves who are actually considered the lowest level slaves are the ones who wash the disciples, uh, wash the master's feet and the guest's feet. And that's why when Jesus, were, when he was washing the feet of his disciples, you know, Peter could, the other disciples, like, like, Wow, what are you doing, Jesus? You're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to be the one washing your feet. So for a Pharisee, he would go inside the house of a friend or a relative, and there, here comes the, the slave <clears throat> responsible for washing the feet of the, the guest. He, he, the, the, the Pharisee would ask, like, are your hands clean? Like, man, you, are, you got filthy feet, stinky feet, and you're asking if, the, he, if he or she washed his hands, like, because they want to be sure that you are ceremonially clean to wash my filthy feet. And they would not even look eye to eye with those slaves. But Jesus was different. He was the one who washed filthy feet, stinky feet. And he said to his disciples, be like me. As I have done it, your master, so you should also do. Amen? Okay? And so the Pharisees were different. They want importance. They crave for importance. And they honor and to be served. That's not our master. He didn't exalt himself. He went down and served. And all the way to the cross, he served. Number four, Compassion versus judgment. The word compassion means when you are touched with such concern out of sympathy for somebody who is struggling or somebody who is uh, uh, in trouble and you want to alleviate that person's suffering and trouble and pain. Judgment meaning you are out there just fault-finding and condemning people. Jesus went and looked for sinners who are struggling so he can help them. So he can forgive them, so that he can empower them. The Pharisees were looking for people to blame, to find their faults, and then condemn them. In John 8, verse 3 to 11, we can see the difference here between the Pharisees and Jesus. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. So you, you can see again the partnership, the real teachers of the religious law or the scribes and and the Pharisees. And this is very, very important because they were going to confront Jesus concerning the application of the law. Okay? And so as he was speaking, meaning he was speaking to a group of people, there was a crowd. Let's go further. So they brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery and they put her in, the, in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses, see, the teachers of the law, the scribes and the lawyers needed to research this to be sure. And you can actually find this in, in Leviticus 17 or in Deuteronomy, I think, 20. Okay? The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use, they can use against him. They were not asking so that they can be guided how to implement the law, or they were not asking because they do not know. They were asking to trap Jesus. And there were two potential answers here that they thought, one of which Jesus will answer to their question. Number one, they knew him to be very compassionate. He was the friend of sinners. And so therefore, if he will let go of the woman instead of stoning her to death, 
then he will be accused of violating the law. Because the law requires he who commits adultery should be put to death or stoned to death. In, in Leviticus, he didn't mention how to put to death. Just put, put the persons to death. In Deuteronomy, it's specific, stoned to death. Okay? So they were only expecting to, okay? Now, if he answers and, and say, okay, stone her to death, then he would be in trouble to the Roman authorities because the Roman authorities do not permit execution without their process and without the Roman authorities doing the execution. Remember, Jesus, the religious people of, his, of this nation could not put him to crucifixion unless they brought him to Pontius Pilate, to the Roman governor. You got this. And so now, Jesus did not respond either of the two possible questions. And, and what, how did Jesus respond? But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. It's a big question. Wrote in the dust with his finger. It is just assuming. This is a lot of assumption here for theologians, scholars, and pastors like me. When it comes to your sins, Jesus writes it on the dust, in the sand, meaning it can be easily erased. Hello, when one admits and repents. An unforgiving person, even if the person already repented and asked for forgiveness, will never forget the harm done against her or against him. But for Jesus, I read many thought, okay? Believe he was simply writing, this woman is an adulterer. And she was writing it on the dust and on the sand. But God's mercy and compassion covers a multitude of sin. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Now, there's nothing wrong with this because the Bible said, Let the witnesses cast the first stone. Now, there's a loophole to this issue. Because Leviticus and Deuteronomy both states that the one who commits adultery will be put to death. Not one person, but the couple. The man was missing here. And some believe, okay, I'm quoting commentaries, scholars and theologians, that the man who committed adultery with the woman was actually a Pharisee. And so the other member of the group, the Pharisees were protecting their buddy, but they were condemning the woman. Are you with me? <laughs> so the possibility that Jesus knew that the adulterer man was with the group. And also, he knew that these people were actually sinners, guilty as charged or not charged, but in the eyes of God were actually like tombs, white on the outside, but dirt, you know, dead bones on the inside. And so he answered it in a way that, okay, yep, she ought to be stoned, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again. And probably he was erasing, in, in the one, when he was writing on the dust, he was erasing the woman's sin and guilt. Possibly. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman, the only one who has never sinned, who is the only one worthy to cast the stone. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. That's compassion. I was watching this movie. I think it was Schindler's List. And I think Schindler shared to this colonel or officer who was just killing Jews whenever... He feels like doing it. When he wakes up, shoots at the 
an, you know, a Jew or Jewish person just walking, doing whatever work or he or she is doing. And I think Schindler said, said to him, you know, what? You, know what? you know what power is when you, have, when you have the power to kill and you don't do it? When you have the power to harm others and yet you don't do it, but you show compassion, that is greatness. And so this, this colonel or this officer tried to, I want to be great, so I have the power, but I would not do it. But you know what? His nature and his mentality and lifestyle and culture is that I am superior and I want to hurt those who are inferior to me. Not with Jesus. He's a thrice holy God. <laughs> no one comes close to him. You can combine all of our goodness and righteousness. We're still filthy rugs in the eyes of God. And yet look at how he treated this woman. Neither do I condemn you. This is greatness. And this is what God wants you to become. What you and I, he transforms into. Compassionate men and women. Not rude, mean, condescending, superior having a superior mentality. Amen? And he said, go and sin no more. You know, I heard and even, you know, just heard some statement on this, that this is not just instruction not to sin, but an empowerment. Meaning, yeah, stop sinning because you have received mercy from me. Do it out of great gratitude. I have empowered you to stop sinning. Amen? Have you watched Les Miserables? The story of that ex-convict that was forgiven by a priest, given the privilege of starting a new life, eventually became rich and became a mayor. This is it. The empowerment of mercy to a sinner. The empowerment of compassion to a sinner. The empowerment of forgiveness given by God, who is worthy to judge and condemn, and yet chose to be forgiving, chose to be merciful, chose to be gracious. That empowers a sinner. That is what this statement meant. Not just an instruction, but an empowerment. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so when you feel like somebody is more like condemning and critical and judgmental and putting you down while elevating themselves, they do not demonstrate nor display the spirit of Christ. That is the spirit of a religious leader. That's a religious spirit. That's demonic. When you say religious, what's wrong with religion? Religion means just it's about beliefs and practices. That's where you get the term legalism. It's about do's and don'ts. It's about rules and regulations. Now, there's nothing wrong with the regulations and the rules of God and the laws of God. But what is wrong when we think that we are righteous on our own by the application of the law and then we condemn others who are not at par with our righteousness. It's not rooted in relationship. It's not rooted in, in grace. A religious spirit is all about doing, behaving, performing. Living in the grace of God, it's about reacting. Reacting what? Reacting to the mercy of God. Reacting to the grace of God. You know, unmerited favor. You cannot gain it, but it was given to you because Jesus died for you. So you're reacting to the grace. You're not performing. You're not doing. You are reacting to how God treated you and me. Amen? I appreciate that in the city of Winnipeg, for many decades, the Filipinos helped those who were newcomers to Winnipeg. We have converted our airport to Manila International Airport too. Have you been to the airport lately? If you're a newcomer to Winnipeg, you would not think this is Canada. Because mostly Filipinos welcome newcomers in our airport. And you see white people or non-Filipinos, they're like tourists. Because if you welcome one family, you know, the one who's sponsored or who's related or connected will bring the whole association of Ilocanos, Bisaya, Batangueños. Everybody will be there buying Tim Hortons and donuts. 
And with the placard, Welcome to Winterpeg. Here's your jacket. Give him jacket. And then you know what? He, he stays in the basement or he stays in another room or he goes to uh, an apartment and yet people will gather all the furniture needed and jackets. And, 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 and uh, uh, what is our culture? A debt we owe, right? Utang na loob. Now we would like to pay it back or pay it forward. Utang na loob in English, debt on the inside. <laughs> No, out of gratitude because of the kindness given to you. You want to pay it back or you want to pay it forward. So next time, let me tell you, the whole association of Ilocanos have grown in numbers and they go to the airport with their placards and jacket. That is grace, a response to the kindness and the mercy of God. That's the grace covenant. That's the new covenant. It's not behaving in your own self-righteousness to do to be good on your own. No, a sinner in need of mercy and forgiveness and God chose to forgive and be compassionate and therefore it empowers you to be a good person. Praise God. Amen? That's why Jesus is a life giver, a religious spirit like the Pharisees. It's dead religion. It's a dead end. And last but not the least, I have to cut this short. Integrity versus hypocrisy. Okay? Integrity versus hypocrisy. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the word integrity is just who you are in public, you're also the person in private. Who you are on the outside, the surface, you're also the person on the inside. And so for Jesus... He was a man of integrity, and he teaches integrity. But for the Pharisees, it's all about pretension. The word hypocrite is simply the word an actor. Like Tom Cruise is behaving like this, but it's not really who he is or how he behaves. That's like the word hypocrite. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. Again, look at the partnership of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees. Huh? But don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for a show. See, hence the word hypocrite, actor, actress. It's all about the facade. It's, not, it's more than just like not pra- practicing what you preach or teach. It's it's more so like I'm pretending I'm showing a facade. This is not really me. So the Pharisees were acting like pious, acting like devoted to God, lovers of God, obedient to God, and they knew they were just acting. They knew that they were just, they're just actors. They're pretending. And in the process, they actually harm more people because they put this burden on other people that they themselves would not do. Or they themselves will not lift a finger or make an effort to help those people that they serve or supposed to serve or the people that they teach. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside and they wear robes with extra long tassels. So what is the ordinary size of a a box with verses, they make it bigger. You know, the, you know, their robes, they make it longer. Just to show off that they are holy. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you are hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, and yet you won't go into yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. Either. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. Why? Because you're not doing it, you're not pleasing God, and you're putting more burdens to other people, and yet you're not even going to help them because you cannot help yourself. And the saddest thing about this is you portray yourself in public as a holy person, as a lover of God. That's hypocrisy. As opposed to simply admitting, I'm a sinner, I have failed, I have failed others, God help me. And God will be forgiving. God will be gracious and merciful. 
So they were adding burden upon burden, yoke upon yoke. Yoke is that what connects a beast to burden like an oxen or a carabao, what connects a wooden, wooden thing on the, at the back of the beast of burden connected to the load that they're pulling. And so they're adding more and more to that yoke of relig religion, more and more loads and burdens that they cannot even carry anymore. And they're crushed by the weight of their sin and guilt and the expectation of religion. With this backdrop, Jesus came and mentioned this famous verse that you have to put into context. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you, and he is a man of integrity. This is what he promised. You are crushed by religion. You are crushed by the expectation of people. You're crushed by your weaknesses. You're crushed by your sinfulness. You're crushed by the guilt and condemnation. But this is my offer to you, and it stands still the end of time. Whoever is burdened and weary, carrying heavy burdens, come to me, all of you. You who are weary and carrying heavy burdens of religious expectation, guilt, and sin, and I will give you rest. I will lift the, the burden, the guilt, the condemnation, the, diff, the, the, the impossibility of obeying God and pleasing God on your own strength. I would remove that from you. I will forgive you. I will lift not just my finger, but my whole body on the cross for you. <laughs> then take my yoke, meaning take now my authority, take now my leadership, take now my rulership. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Let me give an example. This yoke, like a, a mother, a mother ox or a buffalo mother has this yoke at her back and then he, she pulls the load behind. But there's another yoke or part of the yoke that connects the mother to the calf. Now, the calf is not pulling any load. The calf is simply connected to the mother because of this double uh, bow yoke. So the mother is the one pulling the yoke. And she, or he, or this, this calf is only going for the ride. That's when Jesus becomes Lord, Savior, King, ruler of our lives. We put ourselves under his yoke. He's the one who pulls our burdens. That's why he said, my burden I give you is easy and light. Amen? See the difference? Now, who do you want to be your master? Who do you want to be your example to emulate? Who do you want to become? Jesus or the Pharisee? I would like to re read this from the book Pharisectomy by Peter Haas. This is a good book about how he said to joyfully remove your inner Pharisee and other religiously transmitted diseases. COVID. There's a virus called Pharisee. He said the Pharisee, Pharisaical approach, which is legalistic, these are the key symptoms. He said striving. You're always trying hard. The lack of the fruit of the Spirit, like, like love, joy, peace, self-control, kindness, goodness. A consistent lack of motivation for things like prayer or Bible reading. Now, of course, the Pharisees, they prayed nine hours a day. Some of them, if not most of them, three hours interval. Wow, imagine that. So let me encourage you to attend our pre-service prayer. It starts at 7.30. You can go do it by, via Zoom. It will last probably an hour. And this morning, we had the uh, uh, Don Moen of Winnipeg. Fermel did the devotion and led worship and led prayer. And you can just do it, you know, uh, uh, via Zoom at your home. And you can pray for the service because we need your prayers. But... You know, this is not an obligation. It's just like if you want to express your gratitude through praying for our services for Pastor Juni and the people who come here, that would be a good time. But that's not even nine hours, right? The Pharisees prayed nine hours. So to others, you know, simply he was stating here that it is, it is an erratic, inconsistent devotional life, spiritual life. The commands of God feel like a curse. Obedience feels hard. And you feel routinely distant. 
You feel God is distant to you. Now, the grace-driven, the Jesus approach to a relationship with God feels like you just won the lottery. <laughs> what do you do when you win the lottery? I don't know. I just saw the happy dance. Meaning, you, you, you've been given a big amount of whatever even though you don't deserve it or you don't feel like you're going to have it. And another thing he said to those who are grace-driven or Jesus follower, a desire to shout and scream like a person because out of the joy and gratitude, a strong desire to meet with God over and over in prayer, whether it's a morning prayer, evening prayer, noontime prayer, walking while dr- walking prayer, you know, riding the car prayer, driving. You're just like, God, I want to spend time with you. You're an amazing father. You forgave me. You were compassionate. You were merciful. And you're bubbling with joy and peace and growing in the character called the fruit of the Spirit, the character of God. Amen? That is what Jesus And so today, as we are about to end the service, we're going to partake the communion. These symbols reveal the kind of love, compassion, and mercy and grace God has for you. He did not come to be served. He came to take your punishment. The one who was supposed to stone the woman was the one who was so stone the one who has the right not supposed to but the one who has the who's worthy to stone supposed to be you know because he said oh he who ha- never seen cast the first stone and so that makes him qualified to do that to the woman but he didn't come to stone women he didn't come to cancel culture or cancel men and women he didn't come to condemn he came to save and we can see in the symbols that we are holding the broken body in the shed blood of Jesus. Amen? So, so different from the religious leaders of His time. So, so different from the religious people of our time. There's no one like Him. But we can become like Him if we allow Him to transform us and say, God, I need your help. I need to be like you. Transform me. Help me. Save me. Amen? How many of you are in love with Jesus? I would like you to raise up your hand. Said, oh, thank God, I love him. He who loved me with an everlasting love and gave his life for me. I would like all of us to stand up. And I'll pray before we partake of the communion. God, thank you. Thank you that you are not, in the person of Jesus Christ, you are not like the religious leaders of his time. You're not like the religious leaders or religious people of our time who gain knowledge but use it to out of pride to put down others instead of using it to build out of love to help out of love and God we ask for forgiveness if we are behaving and thinking and acting like a Pharisee if in any way Lord we line up with the five characteristics of the Pharisees instead of the characteristics of God of your son Jesus by your grace Lord thank you for the forgiveness but thank you as well for the empowerment thank you for help supporting us by your Holy Spirit to grow in the image and likeness of Jesus thank you God love you Father in Jesus name let's eat the bread together let's drink from the cup together with just gratitude in our hearts Amen. Thank God. Praise God. God is awesome. God is good. Aren't you glad you're getting to know Jesus? I hope you're not confused between Jesus and some people who are preaching and teaching Jesus, but they don't are they're not talking and behaving like Jesus. I hope you're not confused with that. Amen. And as we get to know Jesus, we're given the opportunity to know, enjoy Him, and grow in becoming like Him and serving Him and following Him. Amen. Father, bless my brothers and sisters, my friends, your people. As we part ways, Lord God, may we retain the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Be given the grace to become more and more like Him. We get to know Him more and more each day. 
we may live a life reflective of Jesus Christ our Lord for your glory for your honor Lord whatever needs and burdens and cares that your people have I pray that you take good care of this people of yours and provide and heal and as you have promised Lord that you're our heavenly father a good father who will give us our needs and who, who knows all of our needs and all of our cares and you will take good care of us Thank you, God. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen and Amen. God bless. Have a great day, guys. If you wish to connect with us online, here are our social media accounts where you can follow us or watch live stream videos of our services. And here's our website where you can join a life group, give online, and watch past videos and many more. Again, my name is Jenny, and here's WhatsApp at IWC.